So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today morning. I hope you enjoyed your coffee and croissant already. <laughs> if not, there's still more afterwards. <laughs> so um, I'm Zui More from Vega Informatic, uh, and I will be coordinating the event today uh, on behalf of Vega. So that's me and. Uh, uh, I will give a brief introduction about Vega before we begin with our talk today. So Vega Informatic is a um, service provider for the pharmaceutical, healthcare, and life science industries. Um, and we are specialized in building the bridge between business and IT. So we really have uh, experts with competencies or dual competencies between with scientific expertise as well as on the technical side. So that's, um, that's what sets us apart in this industry. Uh, and we provide uh, comprehensive services. Are you not able to hear me? No? OK. <laughs> oh. There it is. So you did not hear anything I said until now? <laughs> I don't need another one. Okay. <laughs> so I I have to speak into the microphone, but you will not hear from the microphone. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Uh, all right, all right. So actually, the microphone is for the people who are listening uh, from the live webcast. So it's not for you. <laughs> so I will speak louder for you, but uh, there are people also following us on the live webcast today. And uh, I think they, uh, I need the microphone so that they can hear me well. So um, I will briefly start again. So good morning, everyone. I am Zoe Mori from Vega Informatic. Um, so Vega, uh, Vega Informatic is a service provider in the pharmaceutical, healthcare, and life science, in life science industries. Um, and we are specialized in both the business side and the IT side and have experts with dual competencies. So we provide um, comprehensive services in, in this area, especially in lab research, clinical development, um, CSV as well as um, IT solutions. So we have some events coming up where Vega will be presenting. Uh, so the first one is in Italy in April, and the second is in Germany in May. And it would be great if you can join us there as well. Um, I would like to invite some of, our, some of my Vega colleagues to maybe briefly describe um, about these events. So Matthias, maybe can you give uh, us a few words about the event in Italy? Yeah, thank you, Sui. Um, yeah, the event in, in April will be, I think, a very uh, interesting one because we try to bring two things together which, which normally don't fit together, which is agile and validation. And we'll have a, a workshop um, um, where we show that you can do agile validation approaches. And we have some experience with that uh, in a couple of projects. And I'm really looking forward to that. And I really invite you um, to join us in this event or ask, ask us afterwards um, how this is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. And I will call Christian for giving us information about the next event. Okay, we are also looking forward very much to uh, being in Bonn then in May for the Apex Connect. So that's a more um, uh, te technology uh, focus on the on the Apex, on the Oracle Apex, together with in a in a validated environment. So what are the challenges there to to be agile also in this uh, in this validated environment using the Apex uh, technology? Thank you, Christian. So let's start with our breakfast talk now. Um, this, is, this is an event to get to know each other, to network, also to learn about something new. So today it will be about digital biomarkers. And we have a special guest 
Dr. Ellen Half Davies. She is the CEO of Aparito Health. Um, so prior to founding Aparito, Ellen has worked clinically at Great Ormond Street Hospital, academically at University College London, and also as a regulator at the European Medicines Agency, the EMA. And um, Ellen is also passionate about pat patient centricity, working closely with patient groups, and is a regular keynote speaker at international events. Great to have you here, Ellen. The floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the very kind invitation to join you here um, in Basel today. Um, it's always uh, great to visit. Um, and as mentioned, my background is very much in drug development in pediatrics and rare diseases. So working clinically, academically, um, and as a regulator over the last sort of 20 years. Um, and it was on the basis of that clinical, academic, and regulatory experience um, uh, that I decided to, to start Aparito. Um, so we're a four-year-old company. We're based in Wales um, in the UK and just about to open in Amsterdam. Um, and there's sort of two components. One is about sort of uh, really looking at clinical trial study designs um, and innovative approaches to study designs. Um, and the other is about the, the digital tools that can be used to, to enable uh, that. Um, and the way I see it is is that currently uh, we have what I believe to be the perfect storm, um, that patient centricity is finally moving from being a little bit of a hype, a little bit of a talked about subject that um, to date, if we're honest, I think it, it's sort of been more lip service than actual real uh, delivery. Um, but at the same time, uh, the innovation, um, innovative technology is emerging. Um, and those two things together um, is allowing for us to finally change uh, the clinical trial or the drug development paradigm. Um, and, and I think it's, it's fair to say uh, that, that the timing <laughs> couldn't come quickly enough. Uh, we've been sort of repeating the same old approaches to our clinical trial designs uh, for quite some time. And if you look at how the world around us has changed in, in the meantime, compared to how clinical trials have designed, uh, they're not really uh, comparable. Um, on the one hand, uh, we've got an amazing amount of uh, uh, investment and development in the drugs or the mechanism of actions of the therapeutics that are being developed. So we have, uh, you know, gene cell, uh, gene-based therapy, cell-based therapy, biologics, um, and uh, on the same side. Uh, we noticed that we haven't actually invested anywhere near as much money in actually how we measure the outcome of these drugs. So we end up still relaying, relying on paper-based diaries or paper-based uh, questionnaires at a time we've invested so heavily um, in, in the um, drug. Um, and we also talk a lot about personalized medicine or precision medicine, um, but actually in my view, until we are able to offer a personalized monitoring system, uh, then we're not actually able uh, to really sort of deliver on the promise of this personalized um, medicine um, and this precision-based medicine. Uh, and because of the fact that the landscape around us has changed a lot uh, and these opportunities are, are there, um, it, it is, as I say, um, the perfect storm to make it happen. Um, all of us that have worked in the clinical trial field uh, will actually know that there are numerous challenges and increasing costs to the conduct of clinical trials. And as an example, I've listed three here to do with sort of recruitment and retention. Um, the complexity of the studies that we're now doing is increasing in the number of endpoints, the number of hospital-based visits, uh, but at the same time, 
the clinical site capacity to deliver this is sort of becoming diminished. And therefore, you have uh, patients that are not only expected to travel a vast amount of distance uh, on a very regular basis, um, you actually, at the same time, have clinicians and healthcare workers who are struggling to fit in um, the requirements, especially when it comes to extremely complex rates of administration. Um, that require a lot of clinical input. Um, and as a result, in the rare disease space particularly, we know that you know, parents of, of children with rare disease will actually go to a, a huge amount um, of effort and even move countries in able to sort of participate in clinical trials. Uh, but the emotional, physical and financial burden on them as a, a patient and as a family means that very often it comes can't be accommodated by all patients um, and therefore um, the recruitment um, and the retention be becomes a, a challenge. Um, during my time of doing clinical trials and sort of being at at the patient-facing side of things, one of the things that we would often get told is, why using this endpoint as a primary endpoint for this study where it has no reflection on what we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, and in, in, in addition to the challenges of making sure that you had an outcome measure or an endpoint that was sort of uh, age appropriate and something that the patient could actually comply with, it was the fact that it was still a very snapshot, episodic data capture. Um, and the, the day in which the patient was coming into hospital was influenced by many other factors, not just the patient's health on that day. Um, and that's particularly true in, in pediatrics, as I say. Um, and what we're particularly keen to look at is the sort of day-to-day -day variability uh, that the patient sort of experiences outside of the hospital walls uh, or outside of the clinical walls. Um, and this is extremely important when you consider that only 1% to 3% of a patient's experience is captured in electronic health records, um, which means that we are absolutely missing out on the fundamentally important aspects of the disease burden um, and what the patient really uh, experiences uh, in their day-to-day -day, uh, life. When you add that um, sort of aspect into very heterogeneous diseases such as um, orphan drugs, uh, sorry, such as rare diseases in which orphan drugs are developed for, um, these diseases are very multisystemic, but they're also very heterogeneous in terms of their um, uh, symptoms that they present with, but also the rate of progression, uh, which means that in a clinical trial design, selecting sort of a homogeneous group in the occlusion criteria that can aim to give you sort of um, a sort of efficacy profile is then sort of delaying the problem of describing what the effectiveness and the value in the real world is at a later point. And sort of the selection of your um, inclusion criteria um, makes it in incredibly difficult. Um, when we also then just pause and, and look a little bit at the regulatory landscape, um, this is sort of a, a, a graphic that's been taken from Hans Gerg Eichler, the Chief Medical Officer for uh, the European Medicine Agency, uh, in term where he describes uh, the current sort of uh, drug development paradigm. So you have a few patients uh, evaluated for phase one, a few more for phase two, an increasing number for phase three, and then at the time of marketing authorization, the drug becomes then sort of widely available, but the amount of monitoring and, and reporting from these patients uh, is actually becomes quite diminished. Um, and what people are sort of uh, now saying, of course, is that there is no such thing as this eureka moment at the time of marketing authorization where we actually have the full information that we want or indeed that we need to, to really fairly evaluate the safety um, uh, benefit uh, ratio and that in these complex uh, drug uh, interventions that's coming on the market um, and in these sort of extremely heterogeneous diseases, uh, we should actually be looking at uh, a much more iterative 
iterative evaluation process. So really utilising some of the already established regulatory tools in terms of conditional approvals and things like that to, to, to bring uh, the drug to patients quicker um, without uh, reducing uh, safety kind of uh, markers, but actually maintaining a really good uh, prospective uh, reporting. Um, and that will hopefully then reduce sort of the, the gap between the efficacy and the effectiveness um, and demonstrate uh, the long-term value. Um, and as part of these sort of adaptive pathways or, or more innovative study designs, uh, there's also a, a real sort of understanding now that the use of real-world data up front to really improve the study design uh, can add huge amount of value. Um, and that most importantly, we start to incorporate patient preference and patient views about the outcomes that are important to them right from the beginning. So much, much earlier in the drug development cycle than at the time point of sort of trying to negotiate pricing um, and reimbursement, which actually to start that discussion at that point um, is far too late. Um, so but then we look at sort of the value of data and is all data created equally and what's the hierarchy of data? Um, you know, we, we sort of being conditioned to understand the randomized control trials are the sort of, um, or systematic review from clinical trials, uh, sort of the, the data quality and then the data generation uh, to, to demonstrate that also has a hierarchical uh, value where we, you know, regard data con um, captured during those controlled clinical trials to be the, the top of the, of the pile, if you like. And then other data sources from uh, registries and real-world data and electronic health records generally perceived to have sort of less value because of the rigor uh, they've been collated um, and that kind of thing. And so we're now looking at how do we incorporate patient-generated data into this sort of complex field of data generation um, as well. But actually, I think, you know, the way we're coming into it is to say that patients um, are in control of, of sort of uh, reporting these uh, data themselves and that it's a really important piece of the jigsaw to complement the full view. So it's not about replacing the currently um, sort of uh, available or currently generated data, but it's about adding an extra tool in the armory or a new uh, piece of jigsaw to, to complement uh, the, the understanding and with uh, real-world data um, kind of concept that actually fits in uh, very well. So what do I actually mean by patient-generated data? Um, most of you are obviously familiar with the sort of the term patient-reported outcome. Um, it's been around for a long time. Sadly, it's not, still not been sort of developed or enhanced uh, to its full capacity. Um, but for me, patient-generated data is, is so much more. It's an umbrella term that covers um, all the data that's reported directly from the patient and not actually left to be uh, reported or interpreted uh, by a clinician or a healthcare professional on behalf of the patient. So these include things like videos, photos, voice and text, um, medication adherence reporting, um, wearable device and IoT aspects, um, and you know, not to forget the patient reported outcome in its current format. But that should be one part of the bigger understanding of these patient-generated data. Um, and as I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk, the way that technology is emerging means that now we can utilize videos and wearables and voice to actually develop a digital footprint um, of the patient's uh, well-being. And that digital footprint and the validation of those digital footprints into sort of biomarkers um, is where we see uh, huge value um, in this area. 
And if we look at the sort of continuous data from wearables as an example, um, we anticipate that when we look at how personalized medicine and precision medicine and this continuous data stream might actually be able to sort of be more sensitive to seeing individual change and actually uh, reducing study um, numbers um, and sort of the, 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 the type of endpoints that are selected to power the study that we, we, we're planning um, to do. But obviously, patient centricity sits at the heart of all of this. Um, and, you know, when I m sort of make talks like this, everybody kind of does the whole, yes, but can you trust the patient to do it accurately? Can you trust that the patients are not putting the wearable on their dog and not actually uh, wearing it themselves? And can you trust that it's the patient engaging directly with it? Um, and that comes down to sort of the approach that, that's given to the conduct of the study and really putting patient centricity right at the heart of it. Um, what we do a lot of is engaging with the patient community before we even start to understand their view um, about using digital tools and about incorporating it into their day-to-day -day life. Um, and that's where part of the... I'll say the word conflict, but I say it's more of a slight sort of... Um, this change sometimes uh, that we get sort of hardcore techies come up with solutions that are actually not suitable for the patient's day-to-day -day life and integrated into their day-to-day -day, um, sort of experience. And so by adding yet another burden onto the patient, you're actually making their life harder, not making it easier in the way that we want this technology uh, to be doing. Um, and part of that is to really think Think about the context of use or what I call in a more simpler term the fit for purpose so you might have the most amazing device that sort of accuracy and specificity is perfect but it's so big so cumbersome so ugly so unpractical that you can't expect a patient to cope with it for more than a few hours let alone in a continuous process and that's where you then have a bit of a balancing act between really thinking what's the usability, feasibility and acceptability of the digital tools that you're incorporating into the sort of level of data that you're going to generate uh, from it. And that's a real balancing act that, as I say, needs to be driven by the context of use of what you're trying to achieve. If it's a diagnostic alert purposes, obviously you need a more accurate precision-based device than if it's just monitoring trends over time. Um, and these are really important issues, as I say, when we consider getting the patients and their families to buy into it, but also for them personally to see the value add from it. And it's not about adding yet another layer of um, aspects that they have to kind of remember to do, but it's about taking away some of the other challenges and replacing it with something that's a bit simpler and a bit more meaningful in the way that it represents uh, disease burden to them. Um, and one of the sort of parts that I'm particularly interested in seeing a huge value of this is how this data and how these tools can actually be utilized in more innovative study designs, particularly when it comes to decentralized or remote clinical trials. And as we develop more and more experience of this, I really hope that we can you know, move towards more decentralized clinical trials where we don't actually necessarily need to bring the patients into the hospital for every single visit or at some point indeed into the hospital at all. I think at the moment we're sort of well placed to be in this hybrid model that when we doing our study design, we really consider, do we absolutely need to bring the patient into the hospital for this visit, or can we utilize these technologies either via video, uh, photos, telemedicine, uh, wearable data, IoT data, uh, to sort of change uh, that. 
Um, and this is sort of where, you know, I see huge ambition for the sort of concept of patient-generated data to give us a completely new understanding of the natural history of this disease and the disease burden uh, for the patients, um, and through that to empower the patients to really share the information that's important to them um, and to sort of be a bit more in control uh, of how uh, they manage their disease uh, and track response to therapies um, or not. So it's on that background that Aparito that we designed what we call a SaaS platform for patient-generated data. So the platform's been designed to be sort of disease um, uh, agnostic, so it doesn't require new coding every single time uh, that we deploy it for a new disease or a new um, uh, study context. And uh, we're also hardware agnostic, so we integrate lots of different wearables into the software um, according to what's suitable for the patients um, and the study context. Um, so depending on if it's a pediatric population or an older patient and what are the parameters that might be uh, important for them to consider. And then we have the various modules that you can include or exclude according to, again, uh, if it's relevant uh, for that disease um, and that context from real-time symptom reporting, medication adherence, uh, pros. Um, and the, the key thing about this as well is that the patients download it on their own smartphone or on their own tablet. We do not provide another handset, which is just another layer of burden on top for them to try and remember to sort of uh, charge it and look for it separately to what they've already got integrated in, in their own um, day-to-day -day life. And so these are some of the studies that we've currently got up and running or are just completing. Uh, you'll notice that it's got a very uh, rare disease uh, pediatric focus, but that's very much because of my clinical and regulatory background, uh, not because sort of the technology specific aspect. Um, but we're also able to sort of work internationally. So the tech can be deployed in a multilingual way uh, or even as a white label solution if if a sponsor wants it in their own uh, branding. Um, and as, I, as you can see from these diseases, you know, from complex epilepsy to uh, Tay-Sachs to Duchenne, they're quite different diseases in terms of the manifestations uh, that we are, are looking to capture. Um, and we've got new studies that uh, we're about to deploy at an international level um, in MPS and in neuroneopathic Gaucher disease. Um, but we're working very, very closely with the communities at large. So that's both the patient group and the regula uh, regulators. So we were part of uh, supporting this EMA qualification for a wearable device as an um, endpoint for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but also working very closely with the Gaucher community to develop a, a global registry that can contribute to validating new outcomes um, as well. So um, just to sort of maybe look at some of the enablers and challenges that are um, sort of uh, part of this journey, if you like. Um, I think it's fair to say we're all aware that the pharmaceutical industry and the drug development space is, is an intrinsically uh, risk-averse industry. Um, and, and there's this sort of concept of um, waiting for the regulators to sort of give very clear and concise uh, direction, whereas the regulators are saying, well, you need to give us a bit more insight to the capabilities and, and, and sort of uh, areas that you're looking at. So um, having worked as a regulator and seen some of the qualification procedures and the pilot for the adaptive pathway, you know, I can honestly say that the regulators are definitely keen to explore these in more um, details and to incorporate them but need to be sort of uh, as well sort of sure that they don't sort of uh, impact on patient uh, privacy, data protection, um, and of course uh, the utilization of the data to make a, a decision at the end of it. Um, but I think when you, it's well planned and well managed and you put a risk management plan in place, then uh, you know, it, it's about preparing as best as we can. Um, and throughout it all, making sure that the patient's voice is central to all the discussions um, and validation part of it. 
Um, and I was sort of uh, talking about, or listening to the next talk about sort of agile validation, and um, this is something that we've been uh, grappling and laughing a lot with at Aparito as we've been developing uh, our technology to be validated in this sort of way. And uh, we very much have been working on how to uh, be doing sort of agile software development, but in a way that can still be considered valid um, uh, according to. To, to the regulators, um, and as I mentioned um, already, I'm sort of repeating myself, but I do think it's an important point to make. The regulators are really keen to see these come through. Uh, the FDA have obviously made their own announcements um, and their own sort of launch of a digital uh, tool uh, that can be um, utilised and sort of. Um, incorporated into the way that we capture uh, uh, patient data. Um, and what I also want to try and utilize from this data is that we don't end up in this bottleneck of having drugs arrive on the market with a license from the European Medicine Agency or the FDA, but then hit a roadblock where the reimbursement agencies and the HTA don't see the value um, in sort of uh, reimbursing it. Um, and I think that's where this sort of exploring new ways of defining disease burden uh, from the patient's point of view, that this sort of data can add a huge amount um, of value um, in that regard. But obviously, we, we, we need to sort of take uh, all the stakeholders uh, with us on this journey. Um, there's an African proverb that I love that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's, in this instance, is, is incredibly important because we need to make sure that we take the reimbursement agencies, the regulators, the clinicians, the healthcare professionals uh, with us together, but in a way that, that the patients are, are actually driving it um, in that regard. Um, so, um, as I say, we, we hope to see far uh, a better um, uh, impact from a patient-centric point of view, um, and that could in turn then improve the recruitment and the retention that we're currently seeing uh, as a challenge in clinical trials. Uh, but actually, um, you know, this, this sort of um, getting to, to understand that the real-world uh, disease impact, and we do anticipate as this technology becomes mainstream, it will be a cost-saving aspect too. I'm not sure that at this moment in time that the cost-saving part of it will be the driving factor because there's still kind of cost implications to it. But as we know with any technology, the more mainstream it becomes, the cheaper it also becomes. And so we're already seeing it's much cheaper to deploy a lot of these technologies uh, than it, it has been. Um, so just to share some of the experience and operational challenges that we've uh, experienced in uh, conducting our clinical trials, um, and, and one of them is actually the support for the patients in their wearable devices. So we've ended up with wearable devices in the bath, in the washing machine, um, apparently a dog at once. <laughs> it really reminded me of uh, the dog at my homework kind of line. Um, but we also have seen in some of the patients uh, with behavioral issues that the patients were actually biting through the straps as well and these were sort of not necessarily sort of uh, expected so even when you do as much prior work as possible that there's always will emerge unexpected um, problems and then you obviously need to replace them but also then resynchronize them for the data uh, damage um, we're also seeing that, interestingly, in our patient cohort, the youngest patient we've got is five. The eldest patients we've got is 67. Um, and what's really interesting, it's the teenagers that we've had the hardest time uh, engaging with because they, in their mind, had thought that they were going to be getting um, a sort of iPhone watches. So very disappointed that when they got their devices, they weren't quite as blingy as, as they'd uh, hoped. And it sort of reinforces the point I was making earlier, I guess, uh, that we have to make sure that long-term 
um, these patients that, that uh, will be wearing them actually feel comfortable to wear them um, all the time. Um, and with sort of that uh, the, the kind of uh, data privacy, data protection um, is, is sort of uh, central um, to how we do that. So I'll uh, summarize and sort of lead on to um, uh, sort of a more discussion and, and question and answer, I guess. Um, I hope that I've been able to uh, sort of convince those of you that might be new to the concept of patient-generated data um, and digital biomarkers that this is really a new uh, opportunity to, to move, you know, finally towards a more patient-centric approach uh, that allows uh, clinicians and patients to communicate and engage um, in a far more uh, sort of real-time sort of approach between hospital visits, um, but that it has to be central to understanding the usability, feasibility, um, and acceptability um, of that uh, patient group, which there is no such thing as one size fits all. So every patient group um, will need to have a different consideration um, of what's sort of important to them. Um, the pre-configured uh, simple UX one is actually incredibly important too. Uh, we can see which part of the technology patients sort of quickly drop out engaging with if it's sort of too complex, complex uh, to navigate. Um, and then one of the other aspects that I think is well worth um, sort of uh, spending a little bit of time discussing is what we call the healthcare activation, um, uh, sorry, healthcare professional activation. Um, and this is sort of down to making sure that the principal investigators or the clinicians themselves are actually on board with this journey as well. Um, what patients were reporting to us as being most frustrating was that they were reporting uh, and completing all the sort of uh, assessments electronically and wearing, but when it came to the discussion with a the clinician, they were clearly sort of asking the same questions again or showing that they had not actually read uh, or been following that data. And then patients felt that they were just having to repeat the same thing twice as opposed to sort of making it, um, you know, reporting it in the, in, in the time that it happened, avoiding issues like recall memory of trying to remember what happened when um, and not sort of being able to be as clear as you'd want to in the clinic room with your doctors and, and sort of saying uh, when the worst attack you had or when the worst pain you had uh, relative to it. But the kind of clinicians were a bit hesitant to, to rely on the data so I think there's some work to be done there in presenting the data to clinicians in a way that is sort of um, manageable and meaningful to them so they don't go through streams of data and try and sort of glimpse out the, the value of it and present that in the clinical dashboard in a way uh, that is uh, really meaningful. Um, and then just to sort of, uh, you know, point out the obvious, but that we need to really um, embrace the regulatory compliance uh, side of things. Um, it is, I think, um, a worry at the moment. We see a lot of uh, rapid interest in the digital health space. Um, but it comes sort of because the regulation is not as uh, sort of clear and concrete as, as some would like it to be, there is uh, room for, you know, interpretation of your own sort of um, so the way that you implement it. Um, and one of the worries that I have is that if we don't apply good rules of code of conduct or good sort of self-regulation in terms of how we roll uh, this out, if it comes to problems of either data breaches or, or poor data quality, the regulators will then have to do what they have to do in terms of health protection and have a knee-jerk reaction and clamp it all down. And if we then end up having the regulators, you know, really enforce tough regulations that clamp it down, that will then, of course, be more of a burden towards this innovative approaches, which we're trying to embrace and trying to promote um, and really encouraging as a way forward. Um, so, you know, we just need to make sure that that the balance is right um, in that, as I say, this is sort of code of conduct in which these are sort of being uh, operating in um, and the sort of um, 
self-regulation that comes when the sort of current regulatory landscape um, is not as um, sort of uh, clear as, as we would like it just yet. Um, so that's uh, my presentation. I'm very happy to uh, open the floor for discussion. Thank you. Thank you for the very exciting talk. So we will open for questions now. Uh, maybe we'll start with the audience here, but we will also take questions from those listening in online uh, through Matthias. Um, so yeah, any questions first here? Yeah. Yes, uh, so very uh, interesting talk. Uh, close to my heart because I'm trying to use this technology uh, for our basically more of a proof of concept studies yet. So one uh, additional thing I want to ask your opinion on is that what we see increasingly in some of our controlled clinical trials is an increase of placebo effect. So do you think this technology of digital biomarkers can help us in that? And do you have some experience already? Uh, so, so if I just, I'm going to repeat the question just to make sure I've understood it. Do you think that the placebo effect that we see currently in randomized placebo controlled trial can be picked up earlier through the utilization of this clinical trials? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I think, you know, we know from placebo effect, it's not actually about taking a placebo tablet per se. It's about the extra care and support that you get as part of being on a clinical trials. So the additional healthcare professional contact, the additional support also contributes in parts to a bit of a... a a placebo effect where patients actually get slightly better standard of care, to be honest, because they're seen more often, and that does contribute to some of that placebo effect. Um, there is, of course, the question where, you know, if you introduce more digital tools to support them, whether that will just enhance the placebo effect in some ways. Um, so I, I, I haven't got experience to define yet whether we think uh, it will be, but I think as this technology becomes mainstream and if people use it all the time, then using it as part of a clinical trial will mean we won't you know, see placebo effect from the differentiation from what, what their day-to-day -day is in or out of a clinical trial. Kind of my thoughts Thank you. It. So I think there's a... Okay. Um, did you... Um, think about the fact that you eventually introduce some special bias when you use technical devices because I mean as you already mentioned uh, you only get basically the techie uh, savvy people to use this so you might just by using these devices uh, introduce a new bias when you didn't have this did you ever see this did you ever look into this well, what yeah, do you... so, so just to sort of make, make sure my point was understood is that patients, we, we are not um, sort of discriminating people from using the technology because they are not tech savvy. We think they need to have the extra support to make them digital, literate in the, in the digital space to be able to, to use them. So certainly from clinical trial point of view, you know, you would do your training and make sure that they were able to use the technology um, in the same way, whether they were tech experienced or not. I think you're right that there will be possibly a bias when it comes to routine clinical care. So those that have access to uh, you know, technology will, will sort of then broaden it. We've got a study in India and in South Africa where actually what we, the value we're trying to add there is that some of these patients have access to a smartphone, but they don't have access to a doctor. And so we're actually trying to see, could we reduce that bias of giving healthcare to those that have access to a smartphone, but possibly not to doctor in a way that can hopefully support their um, way. But I think, you know, there's definitely truth in some of the aspects you're saying in terms of introducing some bias, but then it's our responsibility as healthcare providers to make sure that it's introduced in a way that, you know, it's as passive and user-friendly as possible, that you don't have to be a, a techie, digital sort of geek to be able to, to, to use or convey some of the simplest terms. Thank you for our information. Uh, what, what do you see 
the ownership of this patient-generated data? Belongs it to me as a patient, or are you, the company, own it? It has to be dictated by the consent. So as part of the, the way that the data is captured, it, it has to be very clearly specified in the consent process when you choose to share uh, your data as a patient-generated data. So that's where I guess in some part I was referring to the self-regulation and the good code of conduct that you know the patient always owns the data but they give the consent for it to be shared much like they give consent for the data to be, you know, clinical data to be shared in clinical trials. So the consent has to be extremely clear um, and the data sharing of it has to be in line with what the patient's given their consent uh, to be. So, um, you know, it might be just for clinical care or, you know, in the sort of context of what I was talking about, it would be as part of clinical trials. And what is your opinion? Will this be a market in the future? Can I sell my data and earn money? So it's, it, this is sort of, you know, um, it's an interesting one. So I'm part of, the, are you familiar with IMI, Innovative Medicine Initiative? So they have the paradigm one, which is about patient engagement. And there's a lot of talk about giving patients fair market value as a sort of reimbursement for the time that they are put in to help design clinical trials and explain about disease burden and, and that kind of thing. And I know that when it comes to genomics, genetics data at the moment, some of the sort of startup companies are saying, well, we'll pay patients to, to share this sort of data. Um, in the rare disease space, you know, these patient groups tend to be very altruistic and they want their data utilized to have a better disease understanding um, of it. Personally, I, I think it's, it's a ethically difficult one to know how we gatekeep the concept of selling your health data for financial reimbursement unless it can be sort of really um, sort of ethically evaluated and sort of regulated in a way that's, that's transpired. But at the end of the day, if it's your patient data and you fully give your consent in an informed way that knows what the implications of selling your data is, then, you know, it's, it's kind of possibly down to you, I'd say. No. So, uh, we've got a question from our millions of people watching online. And uh, one, the question is, what about device management system integration to existing IT systems and constant flow? Uh, yeah, so integration is, uh, is possible. It doesn't mean to ECDT, so the current clinical trial. Yeah, integration is possible um, in terms of, you know, it's about sharing the API of the SDK in terms of that data integration. Um, and was there a question about consent uh, as well as a separate part? Uh, the question was, um, what about integrations to existing IT systems and consent flow? Well, yeah. So, so from the consent flow, I mean, again, it has to be part of the, the patient knows that w what data sources are being accessed um, and integrated. Um, my C CTO tells me that integration from a tech side of things is always possible. It's more to do with sort of the control and the access part of it uh, that, that makes it more important. But what I would say, having worked as a regulator, what we certainly don't want is just completely separate siloed data sources that you can't end up integrating to, to add the real value to it. Um, so it's not to say that everybody should have access to everything, but that there should be a way of integrating it at least. So I have a question. Um, can you detail a bit the steps that a sponsor would need to go through to implement a digital biomarker or novel endpoint in their study, especially you know, with respect to clinical validation, mm -hmm. uh, since many of these are novel um, kind of endpoints which have not been really tested, so you don't know if they really are giving you the right measure of the disease uh, as a usual biomarker. 
Yeah. So I'll, um, I guess I'll talk through how we've done it in some of our examples to date. Uh, we actually start with quite a bit of in-depth work with the patient group communities and the key opinion leaders to identify what outcomes um, are important to be measured. And then we work from the problem, not work from the tech side of things. So we work, say, from what they say we want to be measured um, as disease burden outcomes that are important to them. So falls, fatigue, activities, mood, what, what, you know, whatever clinical manifestation. And then we work backward, backwards into, you know, which digital formats would be best to capture that. Would it be a wearable device? Would it be a video? Would it be voice? Um, and then um, when it then comes to validating it, I mean, the earlier that you can do it, obviously, the better in terms of developing either uh, natural history studies that can utilize it and validate it as long as you apply a sort of quality management system to the technical validation from the tech validation kind of thing um, you know that can be applied but then from the clinical validation you need to demonstrate how it correlates to other clinical markers that are currently being used in practice now when we took the wearable device um, continuous wearable device to the regulators um, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy there was a, a lot of debate of how it correlated to the six minute walk test which is the currently sort of gold standard tool for measuring outcomes in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you know, and for me, it actually opens quite a complex tin of worms because everybody clinically says that the six-minute walk test is a really bad endpoint for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So if the new tool correlates to the currently used tool that everybody says is bad, well, do we just have another bad thing? <laughs> and if the new tool that you're developing actually doesn't correlate with an endpoint that everybody says is bad, how do you then do your qualifi sort of your clinical validation and you're demonstrating your clinically meaningful thing? So, so there's the technical validation and then there's the clinical validation in terms of how it fits and, and correlates and, and demonstrate clinically meaningful differences um, in, in that context. But, you know, and we were having a conversation earlier the problem is that you're going to have to bring forward a lot of the costs in developing these earlier on in your drug development cycle. And for some smaller biotechs and for some, you know, we were talking about it earlier, it's hard to justify investing in a new device where the six-minute walk test might be just the cheaper option. So the cost savings certainly not there yet. Yeah, that's a challenge for sure. Any more questions? Um, so I'm wondering about the kind of data that you are currently collecting with your device in your ongoing projects and also about your um, future ideas or perspectives because of um, I'm thinking about implanted probes that are collecting even um, more specified data and um, are you envisaging this as well? So the current ones we're using, so we've got different wearables device being used in all the different studies. So, um, you know, they are your cadence, step length, um, distance, heart rate, sort of usual vital signs kind of combination, depending on if it's a, a medical grade one or a more consumer grade one that we're looking at in our current one. But more and more of the studies that we're actually doing actually has videos and voice incorporated. So videos of activities of daily living and, um, and sort of uh, photos and things like that. Um, not just a wearable on its own, because I think the wearable on its own only, again, like much with anything else, needs to be contextualized. Um, we haven't yet ventured into um, actually incorporating implantables into our study designs. Um, we... It's not to say that we don't see uh, that it will become part of, of some future uh, development. But, but for us, um, I think that the space is not quite sort of mature enough yet. And just to sort of get the concept of sort of wearables that patients can take on and off and be, still be a bit more in control. Um, I see huge value in the sort of implantables where it comes to, you know, um, insulin or, or sort of cardiac um, sort of uh, sort of care clinical care kind of thing um, but possibly I think there's a, a bigger ethical dilemma for when it's just for monitoring kind of aspects as opposed to actual 
care delivery point of view. Um, and, and I think we just need to sort of see how that goes. Um, the um, approval of the tablet, the digestible tablet that demonstrated that a patient had swallowed was, you know, a big step forward in the ethical debate of how, how this sort of may, may emerge, uh, but we haven't invested it in it specifically ourselves just yet, even though we're always looking for new IoT or looking for new wearables, hardware to, to integrate into the software. Maybe one last question, if there's... A Um, I, I would like to know what your experience are on the uh, investigator side. So on the one hand, we are collecting plenty of data and now even continuously, but the investigators are used to their schedule of assessments, uh, patient appears and then the, all, all the assessments are conducted. So how does that fit together? What is required uh, in order to prepare the investigators? Yeah, um, so I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting question because I would say both the, the principal investigator and the biostitians, if there are any biostitians in the room, <laughs> um, are the ones that are actually sort of really been um, uh, sometimes difficult to engage with in terms of sort of what do we do with all this data? I mean, data is great, but unless it has any clinical meaning or clinical value, or unless there's something that I can actually act on at the end of it, then, then is it really valuable? Um, from a clinician's sort of PI point of view, I think that's where the data scientist and, and us really have an obligation and a uh, responsibility to convey it in a way that they can trust the data analysis and sort of, but actually give them meaningful outcomes. So not just reams and reams of sort of data files, but sort of what the what the meaning of the data was at the end of it. Um, and also that comes from a sponsor's point of view is sort of how do we translate this data into something that's clinical meaningful that actually we can report to regulators and reimbursement agencies and sort of you know really back to, to patients so for, for long-winded an answer to your question. Um, it's, it's sort of a, an obligation on the data scientists to make sure that actually we're finding meaningful uh, sort of outcomes in this data and that we don't get sort of lost chasing rabbits down the wrong warren holes um, and making sure that we always come back to validate it on the clinical side of things into something that's truly meaningful uh, to the patients and, and to the clinicians. Okay, thank you very much, Aline. Thank you. So uh, you will be here for another 10 minutes, I think, if you want to yes. talk to her. Uh, before she leaves to catch off light. So thanks everyone for joining us and yeah, welcome for another coffee if you want. <laughs>